Hi, Neri. We're trying to take the upcoming election cycle seriously. We're especially trying to do all we can to help people engage without being jerks. Now, neither are going to be easy, but both are important. And so important, it may be worth practicing how we do this. So, we want to invite you into a one off experience we're calling an estuary gathering. Estuaries are places where freshwater and saltwater combine, leading to unique forms of life. Estuary groups exist elsewhere in the country, and we are stealing the idea. Basically, the design will be a living room with about eight people. After enjoying dinner and a beverage, you'll then circle up in a living room with a trained facilitator. After everyone states what they'd like to talk about as it relates to politics or the election, the facilitator will then lead the group into a discussion. So, what's the goal? To build muscle memory or to real play and practice what it's like to talk about hard things while maintaining relationship and community. These gatherings will run from 6 to 9 p.m. on Friday, September 27th. We would love for you to participate. Feel free to email me at hannah at narratechurch.org to sign up or for more information. In the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave King Jehoiakim of Judah into his power, as well as some of the vessels of the house of God. These he brought to the land of Shinar, and he placed the vessels in the treasury of his gods. Then the king commanded his palace master, Ashpenaz, to bring some of the Israelites of the royal family and of the nobility. Young men without physical defect and handsome, versed in every branch of wisdom, endowed with knowledge and insight, and competent to serve in the king's palace. They were to be taught the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the royal rations of food and wine. They were to be educated for three years so that at the end of that time they could be stationed in the king's court. Among them were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah from the tribe of Judah, The palace master gave them other names. Daniel he called Belshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the royal rations of food and wine, so he asked the palace master to allow him not to defile himself. Now God granted Daniel favor and compassion from the palace master. The palace master said to Daniel, I am afraid of my lord the king. He has appointed your food and your drink. If he should see you in poorer condition than the other young men of your age, you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel asked the guard whom the palace master had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. You can then compare our appearance with the appearance of the young men who eat the royal rations and deal with your servants according to what you observe. So he agreed to this proposal and tested them for ten days. At the end of the ten days, it was observed that they appeared better and fatter than all of the young men who had been eating the royal rations. So the guard continued to withdraw their royal rations and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. To To these four young men, God gave knowledge and skill in every aspect of literature and wisdom. Daniel also had insight into all visions and dreams. At the end of the time that the king had set for them to be brought in, the palace master brought them into the presence of Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with them. Among them all, no one was found to compare with Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they were stationed in the king's court. And every matter of wisdom and understanding concerning which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in the whole kingdom. And Daniel continued there until the first year of King Cyrus. Thanks. Daniel jumped in in a pinch because someone got sick, so th- thank you very much. Uh, fun fact, I-, I was thinking about this one this, this morning and kind of forgot to build this in, so I'm just going to do it now. Many scholars would argue, and I'm actually pretty persuaded by this, that Daniel is actually, was actually Jesus' favorite text, uh, that it's the one that animated him more than any other. I mean, Isaiah is a big deal, too. But really, we won't get into that till later, other than to say that whole notion of the Son of Man, that's here. And that's, that's the identity that Jesus claims for himself more than any other. But where I'm excited is, you know that feeling where you have two friends who you know, like, 
independently from one another and you get the chance to, like, to introduce them and you're just convinced they're going to hit it off. It's kind of the way I feel this morning and felt all week in anticipation of the series because I love you all in this space and I'm so proud of especially like even what Friday represented in your desire to, to do this differently. And I know not all of you could be there. It's not a passive shot against anybody. But I have a friend, actually, he'll be here in a few weeks and he and I have been talking about this season for months um, maybe about a year, and he was a lot like us going into the last election. He was convinced that they were a community that was 50-50 kind of thing when it comes to politics, and he was convinced that they could do this, and it just about tore their church in half, and actually he contemplated like resigning from the whole thing when it was all over, which just makes me so proud of you all and this space and what God is doing here, and I'm really, really excited to like give you Daniel. I feel like there's this strength that you already have and you haven't even met Daniel yet. Well, maybe you have. And I don't mean to overplay, like I'm not, an, I'm not a Daniel scholar. In fact, I'm probably like a lot of you, I've mostly avoided this book most of my Christian life because especially the last few chapters are so weird and freaky. And in fact, one of the ways I've memorized how to find Daniel in the Bible is it's Ezekiel, then Daniel. So it's like the weirdest book in the Bible followed by maybe the next weirdest book in the Bible. And I don't mean that disrespectfully, but the first seven chapters are so darn fun. And I'm excited uh, maybe to give you some room to sit within them. In fact, maybe you've never read the Bible before. This would be a great season to start. I mean, you could join us in the Gospel of Matthew or you could join us in Daniel and just every day, just read the first chapter this week and challenge yourself to ask 10 questions and just see if God doesn't show up in that space. Here's one of the reasons I'm excited is what, what, if, what if our lives are animated by the stories that we treasure? Now, I've been persuaded by this for a while. In fact, we named a church after this principle. Uh, it's this notion that our lives are not really a reflection of our principles or our axioms or our, our proverbs, even though we, those are the things that we pin to the wall. But actually, it's the stories. It's the stories of the women and the men who lived out these things. And I would guess that if you were to really try to assess some of your deepest seated values, they're always attached to a person Someone who put flesh on it and lived it out. I was first awakened to this when I was 18 years old. Uh, there was a church that I was sitting in the back row of for a couple of years as kind of a cultural Christian, I think, at the time. And I was, I was enjoying that space. I think it was the Sunday I graduated, but it might have been the weekend after or before. It's fuzzy in my head. It's been like 80 years but the guy who spoke was a guy named Garris Elkins. I can remember that. He was a friend of Stan Simmons. And I think he was a missionary in the Eastern Bloc. I think he'd been a local church pastor who then like they redirected their life to go to the Eastern Bloc somewhere and was back in the country. And he told the story of Exodus chapter three. And it quickly became one of my favorite stories in all the world and one of my animating ones. The story is about Moses who was this failed leader who seemed to lack anything to offer God, who tried to do some things for God, was embarrassed in the process, went back to just a, a pretty anonymous life in the wilderness, lived in that space for 40 years. At 80 years old, he was hiking his way through the wilderness, doing the thing that shepherds do, when God appeared to him and said, Moses, I'm calling you to go into Egypt, and together we're going to lead the people out of Israel, which is a pretty tall task. And Moses says, I think it's a pretty natural response. Moses says, who am I? And I've always kind of envisioned, I think Gareth told the story this way. You definitely have to, you're definitely taking some liberties with the story. But I've always envisioned that he's doing that thing that we all do where you're like, okay, I'm going to need some assurance that I can do this. Like, who am I? Come on, go ahead. Tell, remind me of my resume. And God just says, I'll be with you. By the way, what's in your hand? And he goes, well, it's my staff. I like use it to hit sheep in the butt. He was thrown on the ground and it turns into a snake. Pick it up, it turns back into a staff. And it's this whole story about a God who's saying, my, my version of that all the way through my 20s was it's God's gig. And that story, in my own kind of low points and years later when someone said, hey, you should get a teaching degree and then I got invited to intern at this church and I remember the first handful of times I actually taught the Bible, the guy I worked for would give out these review sheets and the most common thing I got in the review was stop being nervous Turns out isn't actually a very helpful feedback at all. Like came out of the shoot this way. There's nothing I can do about it. But for me, it's, it's this example of what are the stories? And, and, and whether you're already resolved how you're going to do this election or not, I think there's an invitation of Daniel to, to either 
like go at it his way or rethink the way you were planning to do it, at least to see an alternative. And part of what I think that makes this so important, especially if you're someone who doesn't follow Jesus, is there's so many negative examples. And quite frankly, those negative examples are going to be like, uh, how would we say this, popularized, raised up the pole. There's all kinds of metaphors that I wanted to use there simultaneously. That the negative examples of Christians doing this poorly will be prevalent. And I'm hoping that Daniel provides this way of doing this differently. Because in many ways, what we'll find from Daniel is our problems, they're not unique to the 21st century. They're not unique to what it means to be American. They're not unique to being Western. They're not that different than Daniel's. The struggles, the opportunities, they're all there. So basic context, Daniel lived in Jerusalem. He was a part of this people who apparently took his faith pretty seriously. For for reasons we're not going to get into, Israel was destroyed. Some of that was like God allowing judgment to happen. I'm not trying to say anything about anything else, but that's what happened in this context. Most people were killed. Daniel was among the best and brightest who who were saved from that, brought to Babylon in order to be indoctrinated into this other way of living. And part of what I think makes Daniel's story so empowering and inviting is he was brought from a culture to another culture. And that other culture was religiously different and socially different and almost every rule was different. Babylon, if you're familiar with this story, is the epitome of that which is against God in the Bible. It comes up early in the story. Now, none of us are living in Beirut right now. And none of us are you know, living in China. We haven't been drug anywhere. But in another sense, the only thing that's different is, is, but we do have this foreign culture that's been brought to us. We've not been brought to it. It's been brought to us. And I don't think that's even true even if you're a, a Christian. Like, it's not just true for Christians. Like, the rules of engagement, so to speak, if you just stop and think about it, they're dramatically different from 10 years ago. And I'm not suggesting that's all bad or that it's all good, but on that level, we can relate to Daniel because his feet are in this very foreign place. And I think he provides waypoints of like, okay, so how do I do this? There's a few questions I want to ask this morning as we jump into chapter one, but I want to start by looking back at the first two verses because these, these are so awesome. In the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. We're going to come back to that because there's some gold in there. And it strikes me, there's a whole generation of people who not pronounce this stuff because of veggie tales. The Lord let King Jehoiakim of Judah fall into his power, as well as some of the vessels of the house of God. Now, you have to ask lots of questions here, like why why, why does he want some of the vessels from the house of God? What's going on there? Well, part of it gets at core identity stuff, and it leads me to this question. What did Daniel believe about God's involvement in human affairs? It's It's a crucial question, I think. And I think as, 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 as the next months unfold, and I'm actually excited that this leads us into Advent, where Advent invites us to recenter ourselves in the story of God, the question becomes, is time linear and headed somewhere? Or is it random or even circular? Like, is this God's creation? Is he, to some extent, in control of it? Now, does he invite human participation? Of course. Is there a consequence when humans participate poorly? Of course. But at the end of the day, part of what we see in the book of Daniel is by all external measures, things went to hell, and in so many ways they did. But hidden within the narrative is a faithful God who Daniel seems to have attached himself to and clung to, who's still doing his thing. Doesn't mean there's not things to grieve, doesn't mean there's not great pain, but he clings to it. Why does the king try to change, not try to change Daniel's name? What's going on there? It's a trivialization of core identity. It's this attempt to get Daniel to look in the mirror and see something other than someone who lives under the reign of God. In fact, part of this is also whether or not God can be known. If you look back at verse 20, it says this, In every matter of wisdom and understanding concerning which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. Question, why does Nebuchadnezzar have this like college of thinkers who by our, in our thinking are just like into magic and stuff? Some of you might even call it superstition. Why does he do that? Because he's in charge of governing the most powerful kingdom in the world. He's burdened with needing to know the future. 
and what he's supposed to do within it. And his means of navigating that become what? The best and brightest who can read the stars and the planets, who, who have this understanding of all of these circumstantial things, we would say, so that they can help direct him in the right direction. And what does Daniel represent in the middle of that? In the midst of that claim, Daniel, you'll see this come up especially next week as we look at chapter 2, Daniel is staking a claim on that this God is personal, he can be known personally, and you can actually seek this God's will. It's not always easy, it's not always crystal clear, but follow God long enough and you'll probably never hear his voice, but if you surround yourself with great people and spend time in the text and commit yourselves to prayer, there will be decisive moments where you say arbitrarily and from faith, God told me. It's a dangerous phrase, but it's also a seminal one. What did Daniel believe about God's involvement in human affairs? And how might your believing something similar help you in the giant swells that are coming in the months ahead? Next question. First verse 8. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the royal rations of food and wine. So he asked the palace master to allow him not to defile himself. Now, Daniel doesn't offer a lot of background as to why he chose this kind of fast. We do know, and we've talked about in the past and will again, fasting is this core, core exercise of ancient faith. I'm not going to get into what he's doing here, but I think it does lead to this question. What did Daniel believe about his role in God's world? So there's a bridge from he believes it would seem that, that God is involved with the affairs of people and he had a role to play. Now we go, of course, he's Daniel. He's famous. He didn't know that. There was a point where he was among how many hundreds or thousands of people who were carted off to Babylon. He was as anonymous as you and I. But somehow, see, we look at the end of the story, kind of like we watch the guy throw the Super Bowl, the touchdown in the Super Bowl. We miss all of the work leading up to it. Somehow, earlier in the story, before anybody but God knew his name, Daniel attached himself to this idea that he had a role to play. I was thinking about this again this week, and I so resonate with this idea of what if I'm just average? Because I think what it speaks to is this notion of most of us, namely myself, are willing to do whatever God's asked if what's attached to the other side of that is, is fame and prestige and credibility power. Not all stories work that way. Jesus offers this warning over and over and over again. Somehow I think we have to appreciate that long before Daniel was a famous name, he attached himself to this God who had a role for him to play. This reminds me of uh, one of my favorite thinkers, Dr. Stephen Delamarter. I had him several times over at Portland Seminary. I consider him a friend. We texted a couple weeks ago. And he's the one that awakened me to this idea that there's really two lenses that we have to read the story through. Uh, One is this lens of salvation theology. And salvation theology, is what we're saying here is that there's significant portions of the text that when you read it, the message is God loves you, he wants you, your sin isn't too big, his grace is enough, the cross is enough, he wants to heal you, he wants to bring you back to him. Every parent can relate to this because there's this like unconditional love piece. And it's very present in the text. The danger is when we read every text through that lens. Because the other lens is creation theology, which has nothing to do with the age of the earth. I'm not convinced, nor am I convinced the scriptures are particularly interested in that conversation. Creation theology is not about that. It's that creation is God's, and every aspect of it has a purpose. It's hard for us to imagine, but somewhere on the bottom of the ocean floor, there's a plant we've never heard of that God has a purpose for it. And the birds, and the insects, and that they all have a role to play. There's this, these spheres of creation and everything has a role to play. And creation theology reminds us, so do you, and so do I, and so do humans. And therefore, we read the Bible with that lens knowing sometimes God's going to assess whether or not you're playing the role he had for you. And with that comes responsibility and accountability And see, part of what we see in Daniel is in the midst of this chaos, in the midst of his core identity being attacked, he somehow is anchored to this notion that he is a son of the Most High God and has purposes within God's world, even if they don't make sense. 
It reminds me a little bit of also N.T. Wright. I put it in a question because it's such a, a bold statement. What if sin is primarily a vocational violation? And what we're talking about here is this. Like most of us, and maybe if you're someone exploring faith, this would capture your view. We see sin as what makes something sin is because God is king and arbitrary or not, he said it is and therefore it is. It leads to this question of like, why isn't a touchdown in football worth nine points? Because there's, there's actually no logical reason why it's worth six. I mean, a soccer goal, one, okay, that seems to correspond. Why, why is a basket in basketball worth two? Why not four? Why not one? See, I think sometimes we see sin that way. Like, why is this thing or that thing sin? Well, because arbitrarily God's king and he got to choose. Like, why is lying sin? Well, because God's God and he said it's sin, so therefore it is. No, to say it's primarily a vocational violation is to say that when you do something that costs you who you're called to be, that's sin. Why don't you put water in your, the fuel tank of your car? Because it's not designed to run on water. It'll ruin your car. What if sin is actually at its core an affront on the role God has for you in creation? And see, Daniel attaches himself to this notion that God has a purpose for him within the whole thing. I don't know when that clicked. I don't know how long it took him to get back to that space. I would imagine it wasn't immediate. But it's an invitation, I think. And then look at this. One more question. In the third year of the reign of King of Jehoiakim of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Okay, this next one I want us to just, just, this is one of those, like, this is why you read the Bible over and over and over devotionally, I think. The Lord let King Jehoiakim of Judah fall into his power as well as some of the vessels of the house of God. Like, did you just catch what he just said there? The country was destroyed, the place of worship destroyed, thousands of lives lost, and Daniel had the audacity to say, the Lord let it happen. Now, is there a time where that becomes a trope, even abuse of spirituality? Yeah, it, there are. But it raises this question for me. How long did it take Daniel to get there? Some of you know exactly what we're talking about. You're in the midst of it now, and you're a long ways from that. The question is, will you do the work? Do you trust that the work is worth doing? Many of us can think of examples where you have done the work. Given a chance, you would testify to do the work. I don't know when Daniel got there. It's incredibly, incredibly bold. The Lord let King Jehoiakim of Judah fall into his power. At its worst, it's spiritual bypassing, but at its best, it's, it's the byproduct of a lot of work with God. Listen to this commentator uh, from the 200s. These words, and the Lord gave, are written that no one, in reading the introduction to the book, may attribute their capture to the strength of their captors. And I love this line. And the slackness of their chief. That at the core of all of this, Daniel, even though he can't probably logically explain it for a long time, refuses to believe that these circumstances are the reflection of a God who fell asleep on the job. The absentee landowner, some of the five horsemen once called it. And built within that, one more thing. Then Daniel asked the guard whom the palace master had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. The other thing that stands out to me here, and I just think it's worth pointing out because you're going to see this come up over and over and over again, is Daniel's kindness. Uh, his, uh, this is where I use the word conciliatory, which basically means doing what you can to bring an argument to an end, not to prolong it. He's not bombastic. He's not rude. I mean, these are his captors for, for, for crying out loud. And he says, would you please allow us. And if you look at the story closely, you'll see that like, his kindness is what won his, his, his jailer over. Again, what if Daniel provides this waypoint, this narrative, this reminder that, yes, we're living in tumultuous socio-political times. Guess what? They're not unique. They maybe are unique to us in our lifetime, but they're not unique. And yes, we're, we're living in the midst of some grave injustice and lots of conversation and a faith that all these different things. And yet, God gifts us, I want to say, with a guy named Daniel 
who somehow navigates this in a way that I dare say anybody reading it would go like, man, that guy's awesome. And then we follow a Savior who it would seem all evidence would say in the midst of his own life on the planet in the flesh found as many waypoints in the person of Daniel. Like it was what animated him. Along with Isaiah and the suffering servant, it would seem that Daniel was, was Jesus' actual hero in the process. So I don't know where this leads for you. Uh, Maybe for you, you just have to sit with and commit yourself to doing the work of what do you believe about history and time? Is this God's story and then he's taking it somewhere? And yes, he invites human participation and yes, things go poorly when we participate poorly and the most high rules over the kingdoms of the world and gives them to whoever he pleases, which is a refrain that comes up in Daniel later. Maybe you've got to do some work around the role that you play within this and understanding how God's calling you to play that role as a sixth grader or or as a college freshman or as someone who's in this season of life because your field is actually deeply affected by this process. What does that look like? And maybe hardest of all, you've got your own like work to do to really emotionally work through and not spiritually bypass, but sit with God in this space of like, and the Lord let? Maybe there's months of spiritual direction, maybe years of work to do there, but if you can just name that you've got the work to do, what an incredible piece of progress. And for those of you who are here and you don't follow Jesus, we're so thrilled that you're here and we're in no rush. God's not rushing you either. But maybe this invitation to just sit with people like Daniel who kind of, but they defy the way people like me tend to live this Christian faith out. And they remind us that there are people who do this extraordinarily well. You know, part of what reason why we're doing the creed through this, I was just talking to Todd Hunter this week and he said, Adam, we don't just read the creeds to read the creeds. And for some of you, it's a trigger. I've talked with you for months and years. You've been like, I'll do it all. But when we start doing that, like I'm out. And I get it. For some of you, it's a trigger. But here's the way Todd said it, which was so helpful to me. He said, we don't just read the creeds to read the creeds. We read the creeds to remind ourselves, this is my family story. Like, this is who I am. I'm a part of this historic family of God. This is ultimately what I believe. And it's where something like communion comes in. It's taking some claim to some really core things. First of all, that you're broken and you betray God and you need forgiveness and the cross brings that. And the point is that you can feel that and receive that in this moment. It's also this confession that you're not your own, that freedom is a freedom to something. And so God calls us to gather and then to scatter. Come Holy Spirit, send yourself into us and us into the world. And there's just this gratitude that the Christian life, unlike any other philosophy, it's not just based upon your brain cells. It's based upon this claim That when we believe in Jesus, he sends his Holy Spirit into us who empowers us to live his kind of life. So if you're ever taking communion with us, there's bread over here, there's a gluten-free option, you'll have to prompt it. There's wine and juice over here, uh, you'll have to prompt the wine. I'd like to pray. Jesus, um, thanks for the way that you invite us to be part of your story in this season and we just kind of loosen our grip on what we would like that to look like and just ask that you'd help us be faithful Uh, to the present moment and that we could string lots of like be faithful to the present moment together and ultimately call that a life. So Jesus, we, we say, come Holy Spirit, like send your life into us, our ordinary lives and send us back into our world. And we say, pray the same over this bread and wine, like God, would you send your spirit into them and in so doing, empower us for life with you and you and us. Come Holy Spirit. If you'd like to learn more about Narrate Church, find us online at narratechurch.org. You can also look us up on Facebook or Instagram. Thanks for listening.